I, I thought that you guys would like that. Uh, that just kicks off a series that we're going to start next week. It's going to be a four-week series on relationships, and I just wanted to give you guys a teaser to that because I feel like this is going to be a great series that we can grow as a church in, that you can invite your friends and family to, and it's also going to be something that we can have a little bit of fun with while learning and getting better in ourselves along the way. So uh, I'm so excited about it that I said, hey, I want to show you guys a video. Um, you know, before the week comes. So invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors, invite people that you struggle to have a good relationship with, and we'll teach you not what the video says, but we'll teach you how to have a great relationship with them. So I'm really excited to be here. I was able to stand out front this morning and see a bunch of new people that were coming, and so I just wanted to say um, for all of our new people that are here, listen, I realize that for you to give up an hour, hour and 10 minutes, or even depending on how far you travel, half a day to come spend time here at South Point Church, it's a huge honor to us. I mean, this is something that me and my team, we don't take lightly. And so I want to say thank you for that. So if you are giving your time to come here, then I want to honor that time by giving you something in return. And I, I want to give you guys something that hopefully will help your week go better and, and help your week to be better. So so yeah, that's my hope for you. I just want you to know that I love you. Listening to you guys sing this morning, whew, man, that felt good. That, that, you know, you guys wonder, if Chris preaches every Sunday, how does Chris get ministered to? Well, a big part of it is when I stand here and I hear you as a church worship God. That just does a lot to, uh, yeah, a lot to minister to me. So today we're going to finish the series and I'm going to talk about stress. So let's talk about stress as a church. Let's talk about what this thing stress is. You know, this is something that we all deal with. I don't think there's anybody here that's immune to it. It's something that we all feel. And what stress actually is, is stress is like a, a, a tension. It's, it's something that's under tension. And what happens when you put something under tension, it eventually will break or it'll eventually crack. And Stress on our body, stress on our mind, stress on our emotions, stress on our situation kind of does the same thing. It, it can put tension on us to the point where we can almost crack or where we can find kind of breaks in those crack lines in our life. So before I ask you about the stress in your life, Fritz, can you turn me down just a hair? So in your life, how many, where, where's stress at in your life? Is it with a boss? Is it with a, a coworker? Is it with a spouse? Is it, if it's with a spouse or a neighbor, don't, don't bump them if they're sitting next to you. But where does stress come from from you? Or when have you felt maybe like massive amounts of stress? When is it that you've felt um, an, an incredible amount of stress in your life? Has, has it been like every Monday going to work? Or has it been, um, you know, Coming home, you know, at the end of the night when you know you've done something, uh, when you've done some, been out where you shouldn't have been out. Now, I don't know what it is, but I want to talk about stress today. And more specifically, I want to talk about the relationship between stress and peace. And I want to talk about how stress and peace actually work together. Now, what's going to happen with every single person in here is that when you feel stress... It's going to do something, and it's going to actually steal your peace. It's going to take your peace from you. And this whole series has been on how do we find peace. Now, the thing about finding peace is we've spent the last couple Sundays learning about peace. I've told you that the first Sunday, we learn about peace because we go through, uh, we, we learn how to add God into our life rather than take God away from, or rather than take things away. We learn how to add God in. In the second week, I talked about peace from the perspective of you've got to give yourself rest. So you can't let, let your life outpace your peace. And then now this week, we're coming from a different angle. And I feel like it's important, especially with what's going on in the world today, is this. You, you, you feel like, okay, I know all the things that I need to do. I know all the things that I need to do to have peace. I've been to the last two Sundays. Chris has taught us how to have peace, and yet I still don't feel like I have peace in my life. And if that's you, that's okay. We can have all the Bible knowledge in the world. We can have all the fundamental knowledge in the world that we need. But the point is, is that we still feel stress, right? 
So if, if we know how to add God into our lives, or we know how to add rest into our lives, then surely we should feel peace, but we end up not feeling that peace, because stress comes in, and it steals our peace from us. Now, this stress comes in ways that, that we, we sometimes we can't control. You know, there's things in our life that we have absolutely no control over. Right now in the world, in the Ukraine, there's a war that's going on, and there's a lot of stressed out people there, and they have no control over what's happening. And they have no control uh, of their circumstance and their situation. They're just trying to survive and hold on. But then there's other things that you can control. There are things about your stress that you can control. And what I want to help you do is I want to help you to be able to identify where you feel stress. And where you feel stress is actually taking your peace from you. So the point to today's message, I'm going to tell you this, is... At the end of this message, you're going to hopefully be able to find a way that you can actually prescribe yourself a prescription for peace. See, we have today a prescription for peace. So this prescription is going to be what to do when stress steals your peace. Because we go too far and too long, we go through too many days of the week, and we let stress steal the peace from us. We walk out of here on Sunday mornings, and we feel good, and we feel alive, and man, we had this worship experience and this encounter, and I feel great, and then you get in the car, and something happens, and stress comes into your life, and it just sucks and removes the peace straight from you. You lose all of it. You know, I, I don't know what kind of stress you carry, but I'm tired of letting stress steal my peace. And I know that those of you out there, I know there's a lot of you out there that you're tired of letting your stress steal your peace. You're tired of letting, letting this, this peace that you so crave and you so desire just be pulled away from you. And it's an out of control feeling. You know, I was, I was last night when I went to bed, I was talking with Casey. And I just was, was explaining this exact thing. I was saying, man, I wish that that these things had happened differently in the night. We were talking about, you know, how we made dinner and things like that. But I was like, man, this, there's these stresses in my life, and it steals from me my ability to have peace, even simple peace, peace like sitting around and watching TV. I'm not afraid to own up to that or admit that because I know that you guys all feel the same way. I know you deal with the same thing. And so just to illustrate this, what I want to do is I want to take you guys through a bit, a bit of kind of at the time, it wasn't funny, but now it's a funny story looking back on it. But this is a time in Casey and I's life where stress actually stole the peace from us. Now, we've got a picture here of me and Casey and the family camping. So we used to live in Nelsprit. We used to live in Pumalanga and actually White River outside of that. And we had this Defender and we went camping and this is in Kruger Park here. And so we had a nice little campsite set up. And we, we love camping. We love driving through the park. And we went on a camping trip. And on the last day of this camping trip, we're getting ready to drive out of Kruger Park. And Casey says, I want us to stop at one of the, the rest areas and have breakfast. And I'm thinking, I don't want to stop for breakfast. I just want to move straight on through so that we can get out of the gate. Because I was probably already feeling stressed about something. So it's probably also... I think this was a trip where it was like 48 degrees and we were just, you know, you're in a Defender, so there's just heat radiating, you know, up from the, uh, the bottom of the floor from the gearbox on you. It was so hot and sweaty and rough roads and I was ready to go. Casey wanted to stop and have breakfast, so we stopped, we pull over to have breakfast at this place and if you've ever been to Kruger, at some of the rest areas, they have a big monkey problem. And they actually have people employed that they walk around with these giant, huge, long sticks. And those people walk around and they slap the ground and slap the trees and try and keep the monkeys away. Because otherwise the monkeys, they terrorize the tourists. And so we pull in and we get out of the vehicle and we're getting all the stuff together and I'm grabbing the propane and this and that. And, and Casey's trying to get a table and Leafa, our son, is moving at like half speed because he didn't sleep well the night before. And, and I'm watching us as we try and move from one table because the monkeys were consuming the table to another table. And I'm standing at the vehicle and I'm watching in slow mode. It, life feels like it slows down. And I'm watching Leafa walk with a crate of a dozen eggs. And I can see the monkeys converging on him. And they come down and they pick the whole crate up from him and carry it up into the tree. And then they throw all the eggs on the ground. 
Now, while that's happening, I'm yelling, Lifa, hurry, move now, move now. So I'm trying to get the family to move to a different table away from the monkeys. And he's in slow mode, and the monkeys come down, and they throw all the eggs down. Now, thank you, Lindsay, for laughing at that. It wasn't funny at the time. At the time, I was like, I hate this. Why are we here? I'm sure I was an amazing husband. I probably used the C4 approach that you saw in the video. But it, it, stress took our peace. That was not a peaceful breakfast. It wasn't even a peaceful ride out of the park. Stress came in, and it stole the peace from Casey and I. She wanted to have a peaceful breakfast, and the stress of the monkeys came in and took it. So what we're going to learn to do today is we're actually going to learn how to take back the stress, how to take back the peace from the stress. This is, this is so important because life is never going to stop throwing things at you. Life is never going to stop sending monkeys down to take the eggs from you and throw them all on the ground. I mean, I could have never dreamed that story up. I could not believe it was actually happening. That not only were the monkeys coming down, but they were carrying perfectly balanced a dozen eggs up into a tree and then taking the time to throw them one at a time onto the ground. I never could have imagined that. And life is the same way. There are things that we could never imagine that's going to happen in life. That's going to cause stress to us. And what we do is we'll never be able to prevent that from happening. But if we can learn how to take back our peace from stress, then, then we're winning. Then we've got a leg up. And that's what I hope that you find today. I hope that you find some motivation from this. I hope that you find that, that after this message, you're like, you know what? I feel like I can do that. I can be empowered. I can be equipped. I can take back some of the, the peace that stress is trying to find for me. That stress is trying to take from me. And so in order to do that, I've gone through and I've found there's a guy in the Bible named Paul. And you guys all, many of you know Paul. I would say you guys all know Paul, but there may be some new people here. And Paul is this guy. And what I want you to understand about Paul is this. Is Paul was a guy that helped write the majority of the New Testament. He helped spread the majority of the church after Jesus died. He went to the Gentiles, which are the people that, that were not Jewish. So it would be like all the people that, that weren't a part of, of, of the Jewish culture. And so Paul took the Bible. He took Jesus. He took the gospel of Jesus to all these people. And he spread the word like crazy. But what I want you to understand about Paul, see later I'm going to read verses where Paul's going to tell you how to deal with your stress. He's going to tell you what to do to get peace. But before that, I want you to actually understand that Paul has some credibility behind him. Now, I don't know if you've ever introduced a, a new friend into a current friend group that you have, but oftentimes we come with like, we bring qualifiers to the table. So if, if I've got a group of friends, maybe, maybe the band here on a Sunday morning, and there's a new guy coming in, and I want to introduce them, I'm like, you know, hey, here's this new guy, and oh, I just want you to know that they play here, and they know this, and they're amazing at this, and sort of like giving qualifications to, to the new person that's coming in, and that's what I want to do. I want to give some qualifications to Paul. Now, Paul was a real guy. He was real. His stresses were real. The things that he went through were real. And so there's some verses in Philippians chapter 4, which they're going to put on the screen for you. And this is Paul talking about stress. So this is how Paul earns his street cred. This is how he gets his credibility. And it starts in verse 10. And it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that now at last you have renewed your concern for me. So Paul is writing a letter to the church of Philippi. That's why the book is called Philippians. This is Paul actually talking to this church. So Paul doesn't know he's writing the Bible. Paul is writing a letter that would then be included in a group of books that we would then come to know as the Bible. So Paul is literally talking to this, these people. And he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that now at last you've renewed your concern for me. So Paul's like, you care about me. We all like that. Indeed, you were concerned about me before. But you had no opportunity to show it. So now Paul goes on in verse 11. And I want to show you, I'm reading out of a version called the Amplified Bible. Now, this is my Amplified Bible. I love it. It's my favorite translation because I'm not a super smart guy. And it gives me the context. So not that in verse 11, Paul says, not that I speak from any personal need. So the Amplified Bible just helps you understand that the Greek for what Paul was talking about was that when he says the word need, it was a personal need. It was a personal context. 
So everything that you see in, in this color here is giving context to the scripture. So he goes on in verse 11 to say, Not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content. Content's a word that we struggle with because we don't always feel it. And he says, in contentment, that he feels self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstances. This, this makes me think, regardless of my circumstances, Paul's circumstances were shipwrecks, beatings, he was almost murdered, he was stoned and survived from it. Paul's circumstances were not just that he walked a long road. Paul's circumstances were that he, he almost lost his life over and over and over and over again. So here's this man coming from a place of almost losing his life over and over and over again. And he says, hey, regardless of my circumstances, I've learned to be content. I mean, t- to me, that's just incredible. And then in verse 12, he goes on to say, I know how to get along and live humbly in difficult times. And I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life. Whether I'm well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or a need, I can do all things which He called me to through Him who strengthens and empowers me. So there you have Paul. That's the man that we're looking at. That's the man that's going to give us advice. So that means that this advice that we get for the rest of this message is advice that we can trust. It's advice that we can lean into. Whatever your circumstances are, The advice that you're getting is coming from a guy that went through it. You know, I I have a saying that I like to say a lot, that your worst day is probably somebody else's best day. So that kind of puts our life into perspective. If we think, man, my worst day, someone else would consider that their best day ever. Because the world is a rough place. And so Paul, he goes through so many rough things that he gives us this advice that we can really lean into, we can really take, it matters. So Paul's going to give us three things. He's going to give us what I like to call the the three-step guide to reclaiming your peace. So he breaks it down real nice and real simple for us. And the first step that he says is pray. So prayer is something that we struggle with. So for example, let's say you have a sick child. Your kid is a bit sick. And you go up to a doctor, and the doctor says, okay, I can give you medicine to make your child feel better, or I can pray over your child. Well, we're all going to take the medicine, because we're going to see that it's going to help our child to be better. It doesn't mean that we don't believe in prayer. But see, we like to see action. We like to see things happen. We, We like to see that we can do something that can physically change or improve our situation immediately because we want to see it happen right here and right now. And so we struggle with the idea of like, okay, Paul is telling me to pray. If I'm pursuing peace, if I'm wanting to deal with the stress in my life, he's saying, hey, step one, pray. That's, that's Paul is saying pray, and we're going to see it in the Scripture here in just a second. But see, the thing that you need to understand is that prayer does not have to be your only step. But prayer should be your first step. And Paul says it. We'll turn back to the scripture here. And Paul explains it in verse 6. He says this. He says, do not be anxious or worried. Or no, that's, that's, yeah. Do not be anxious or worried about anything. But in everything, every circumstance and situation... By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific requests known to God. See how cool the Amplified version is? That God wants to know your specific requests. God wants to know specifically what it is that you're dealing with. He wants to know specifically what it is that you're struggling with. Tell God your stress. Tell Him. Tell him the exact thing that it is. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't coat it in these and thous and him nots and whatever it is. Just say, God, I'm super stressed out because of this or because of this. And Paul says, anxious and worried. Don't be anxious or worried about anything. He's trying to encourage you and say, hey, come on, come on. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. You don't have to be worried or anxious. It's like I think when, when Benjamin falls down and scrapes his knee, and, and you can see that moment, parents, you know this. That moment where the child looks and says, am I going to cry? Or am I going to lose my mind? You know? 
And if you're in a public park, it's like, well, okay, we'll let them sort it out. But that never happens there. It happens in a grocery store. Or if you're in line, it clicks. You know, your kid falls over the rail, they scrape their knee, and you see them deciding, am I going to lose my mind right here in this public place, in this store? And you look at your child and you say, don't you do it. <laughs> don't you do it. And they look at you and you see the big eyes. And what we do, what I do with Benjamin is I say, hey, buddy, it's okay. Don't, no, 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 you're not hurt. Come on now. You feel fine. Ah, oh, big man, step up. Come on, shake it off. You know, rub it off. And on the inside, you're thinking, just don't lose your mind in public, please. And this is Paul. He's telling you. He's saying, I see that you've fallen down. I see that you've got worries. I see that, that life has hit you. But don't be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. Let me just encourage you. Let me, let me just, hey, don't worry. Don't be anxious. You're going to be okay. And then he says, in every circumstance and situ situation, by prayer and petition. Prayer is talking to God. You know what petition is? God, will you move on my behalf? God, will you, do, will you work on my behalf in this situation? And then with thanksgiving, it's like, hey, I'm thankful that I get to pray to God. I'm just going to be thankful. I'm going to choose to be thankful about that. But see, God wants to know our specific requests. And that, to me, is, is an amazing thing that comes from an incredibly loving father. Now, I want to give you guys another analogy to kind of help illustrate this. I've got a picture of a trail. Now, this is a picture that I took in the States. This is the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Uh, this was taken maybe six or seven years ago when my wife and I went back uh, to visit our family. This is the trail that Casey fell over a log on. <laughs> And we laughed together. It was actually one of the, the best moments where we both kind of fell over a log and we were just like, it was like a movie. But anyway, we laughed. It was wonderful. So anyway, in, in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, they teach you in a lot of wilderness survival. So, so if you take a wilderness survival course, which I took a lot of because I did a lot of camping and climbing, one of the things they teach you is never get off the trail, but if you get off the trail... The first thing that you do is you do nothing. You stop. So you don't, you don't think to yourself, okay, I'm off the trail. Now I'm going to go run and try and find the trail. I think it was over here, and I'm going to run over here. I think, no, 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 wait, maybe it was up this way, or that tree looks familiar, or no, I think I've already seen that rock. And before you know it, you're more lost than you started with. So what they teach you to do is the first thing you do is you stop. You stop and you think, am I okay? Am I somewhere that's moderately safe? You look at your surroundings. You take your surroundings in. You calm yourself down. You slow your brain down. And prayer is that for us. See, in life, we get off the trail. Things happen. And then we start grabbing at things. And what happens when we start grabbing at what we, what we think are solutions? Oh, I think the trail's just over that hill. And you run up over the hill and it's not there. And you go to the next and the next and the next. And before you know it, you're super lost. And in life, we think, okay, this stress is happening. So I'm going to do this to solve it. I'm going to do this to fix it. And before you know it, you've worked yourself into a huge problem or a huge mess. When all you have to do is just like in wilderness survival, Paul is saying, stop. The first thing you do is you do nothing. The first thing you do is you address your heart and you address your thoughts. And you give those to God. That's not the only thing you do, but that's the first thing that you do. Now there's a powerful statement that I want you to pick up from this. Being lost, I don't know if anyone's ever been lost in the woods, but this can be an incredibly overwhelming thought. It can be an incredibly overwhelming fear. But you know what? God is actually not overwhelmed by what overwhelms you. Yeah, that's a, that's a truth we can let sink in. The things that you feel overwhelmed about, God's not overwhelmed at that. God's got that. So when we start to understand that and realize that, we start to say, you know what, I can be a little bit more hands-off, okay? I can, I can actually, because what prayer actually is, is being hands-off, but prayer is releasing control of that which you cannot control. This... All you control freaks out there is a tough one. Because you've got to say, you know what? I can't control this situation in my life. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to let go and release control. And I'm going to first pray. 
Now, the second step that Paul gives us, the first is pray, then the second thing we do is praise. This is probably not high on your list of things to do, because when life gets super stressful, you're not naturally gravitating towards, oh, I'm going to say a bunch of nice things, or I'm going to praise God, or I'm going to praise my family, or my boss, or my neighbor, or whoever. This is not a natural thing to go to. But what's happening with praise? And see, in prayer, you're releasing control of what you cannot control. But when you praise, you're doing something about the things that you actually can do something about. So now you have things that you can control. And Paul's actually going to tell us in the next verse, he's he's actually going to tell us in verse 8, that there are things that you can control. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to what happens to you. There's a parenting moment, you know, for teaching your kids or for teaching us each other as adults even. I can't control all the things that happen to me, but I can control my behavior. I may choose not to, but I can absolutely control it. And so in verse 8, Paul gives you some insight on how to control that. He says, finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace. You hear all these like nice terms, and not, aren't we supposed to be talking about stress right now? And Paul keeps using all these lovely, you know, nice terms. He says, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. There it is. Paul's saying, if there's anything in your life that you can find worthy of praise, how about the fact that you just took a breath? Because there's somebody out there that just took their last breath. How about the fact that, that you, I could, I could give example, and I, I don't have time to, but there's so many areas where we actually can find a reason to praise God. Because we, we are so blessed with what we have. Even the breath in our lungs is a gift And it's a blessing. And so Paul is saying, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them into your heart. Implant them into your heart. What does it mean to implant praise into your heart? See, what happens is when you praise, something happens chemically in you. It actually stirs up gratitude. Praising God praising that which is worthy of praise, praising things that are excellent, this stirs up gratitude in you. Isn't that amazing how that happens? And we, we probably don't exactly understand how this happens because it maybe it's been so long since it, it did happen. But you know what? We can change that today. Today, you can take time and you can say, whatever my stress is, I'm going to take the things I can't do and I'm going to just give them to God in prayer. But the, what I do have control over... I'm going to introduce prayer and praise and gratitude in it. You know, one of the things that attracted me the most about my wife is that she used to make every human that ever rode in a car with her play the thankful game. So when you got in the car, you had to say three things that you were thankful for, no matter who you were or no matter what. And this was something that was so impactful for me, but she made the decision to do this because she decided I'm a, there's things in my life I can't control, but there are things that I can. And I'm going to be a woman that raises children and a family to be thankful. And I'm going to be a woman that has a household that is grateful. And so gratitude is a life-changing thing. It'll set you free more than you could ever understand. In those moments of stress, just take a minute and be grateful. Just take a minute and find the things in your life, even if it's the breath that you just took, to be grateful about. Now, the step, the the third step that Paul gives us is practice. So Paul's told us to pray. He's told us to praise God. And now he's saying, okay, let's practice. So what Paul means by practice is if we look in verse 9, it says this. It says, the things that you have learned and received, and heard, and seen in me, practice these things. So what Paul is saying at the first of verse 9 is Paul saying, you watched me model how to do this life thing. You watched me 
give up my life for, for Jesus. You watch me survive shipwrecks. You watch me survive hardships. You watch me praise God in the middle of my stress. You've watched me walk in a way that, that just is thankful to God, no matter what the circumstances are behind me. You've watched me lean into prayer and lean into the, the disciplines of just loving God and letting God love you. Paul is saying, you've seen me do this. Now you go and you practice it. You practice because practice is something, especially in daily life, we have to learn how to be grateful. We have to learn how to deal with what causes us stress. It's something that we have to practice. And he says that, that you practice these things in daily life and the God who is the source of peace and well-being will be with you. See, putting your faith to practice actually reminds you of what God is doing in you and what God is doing through you. See, we, we, we have to actually, you, one of the things that I've learned in just dealing with, with my struggles and anxiety and my struggles with depression, and I know there's people in here that deal with the same things sometimes, or, or they, you guys have your own struggles. But sometimes you have to do it before you feel it. So sometimes you have to do the action before you feel the result from that action. Sometimes, no matter how down you are, no matter how hard it is to feel grateful, when you take a look at your life, you may say, I don't find anything in my life that is worthy of praising. Even the breath that I just took is not worthy of it. And, and, and even, even the everything that I have in me, I can't think of anything that is worthy of praise. But you may not feel it, but you can still practice it. And so what you do is you go and you practice. You wake up and you say, today I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the breath that I just took. Or you say, today I'm not going to let stress steal my peace. And guess what? Stress may steal your peace. And you know what you do the next day? You don't let stress steal your peace. You say it again. You know what you do the day after that? You say it again. And you say it again. And you say it again. And what happens is you keep practicing this thing. This thing that Paul says is there and is for you. And the more you practice it, the more it becomes a habit, the more it becomes a part of who you are. You know, I, I know that my son loves watching basketball. And I, I know there's more and more basketball that's coming on TV here. But those guys that, that shoot, their pregame warm-ups, they're shooting for two hours just before a game. They're taking practice shots. You know, um, I heard a story that a lot of those guys will take over a thousand practice shots from different points in the court throughout the week. It's practice. It's repetition. You may not feel it. It may not feel smooth. It may not feel good, but you just got to keep practicing. So I want this to be an encouragement to you. And I want you to remember that when you put your faith to practice, when you actually do these things, it reminds you of what God is doing in you and what God is doing through you because God's not left you. And so through this whole message, your prescription for peace, it involves you releasing what you cannot control and it involves you doing what you can with what you can control. And guess what? I'm, a, I'm gonna end on, on this verse here because this is a promise that Paul gives us in verse 7, I want you to listen to this. I want you to imagine, grab your peace, grab your stress. Actually, better yet, grab your stress. Think about it. What is it that causes you stress the most right now? What's wrecking your peace? Is it your finances? Is it what's coming on Monday? I don't know what it is for you. Is it the clothes you don't fit in? Whatever it is, what's, what stress is grabbing your peace from you? Now, if you take Paul's prescription for peace, then what happens is this verse right here. And it's beautiful. In verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, and this is where, again, I love the amplified version. The peace of God, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace. Who's got a heart that needs to be reassured? Yeah, we all, yeah, come on. We all do. I mean, my heart needs reassured over and over and over again. You know why? Because I'm full of insecurities. I'm human. You know why? Because I mess up. You know why my heart needs reassured? It's because things don't go my way, and that's okay. I have stress in my life. 
And sometimes I get overwhelmed and I think this stress is just, it's never going to go anywhere and it's all about me and I'm so me focused and me centered and I haven't prayed and I haven't taken time to praise God. And Paul is saying, hey, Chris, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace, that's the peace that he's talking about in this verse. And he says, it transcends all understanding. How amazing would it be? If you could not even begin to understand how your stress could be overcome with peace. It's okay if you don't, if you feel that way. Do you know how many times I walked with my wife or I I, I went out for a run or something and I thought "This, this stress that I feel is unconquerable. Nothing can happen to bring peace into my life. I need all these situations to change in order for me to feel this peace. And these situations aren't going to change. And so therefore, I just feel consumed with stress. But you know what? Paul is saying that the peace that comes from God transcends all understanding, which means that we don't have to wrap our head around peace, around where peace comes from. We don't have to understand it. In fact, stop trying to understand what it would take for you to let go of your stress and for you to take peace back from your stress. It's not you to understand. It's not for you to understand how that happens. You know what your role is to do? Your role is to trust and to understand that there's a loving God above that can actually work in ways that you can't even comprehend. And with a peace that transcends all understanding, He will stand guard over your heart and mind in Jesus. And that peace is yours. So the invitation to you guys, as we finish this series, as we wrap things out, the invitation for you on peace is summed up in that that verse, in verse 7 so wonderfully. But it's it's this this invitation is that you don't have to understand it. And... God gives you a peace that stands guard over your hearts and your minds. Man, I want you to accept a peace that you can't understand that stands guard over your heart and over your mind. Wouldn't that be awesome? If we could have something that stood guard over us. You know, I feel safe at night. I feel incredibly blessed and incredibly safe because we have a a high wall and we have electric fencing and we have things that stand guard over our home at night. But that doesn't even compare to what's happening when God puts his angels around my life and around my heart and he stands guard over my heart and he stands guard over my mind. So then when you feel stress come in, God says, no, I'm guarding your heart and I'm guarding your mind. Praise me. Be thankful for me. And then this peace comes and we don't understand how it came, but it comes and it's there for us. And so I want to invite you to do that. Let's let God Give us a peace we don't understand that stands guard over our hearts and stands guard over our minds. There's this truth in His Word that is just amazing and unbelievable, and I just want you guys to be able to grasp it. That I'm so burdened for you that you grasp this because I know that there's some of you out there that have been living with so much stress that's been stealing your peace for way too long, and you don't see a way out, but there is a way out. And it transcends all of your understanding. And so I'm going to pray for us. And after I pray, the band's going to come out as they, as they always do. And they're going to lead us in, in that song, Oceans, again. And the reason that we do this, especially for those of you that are new, I want to give you this quiet moment, this moment of praise before you go out there. Now, we have an amazing thing that happens outside those doors on Sunday morning. It's called Community. It's called people loving each other. It's called friendship. It's called family. It happens around coffee and tea and kids running around. And and that happens out there. But before we go out there and do that, I want to give you a moment in here for you to reflect on what, what we've talked about today. And so as the band leads us in this worship song, I want you to think about, man, what if God, beyond all understanding, just took the stress that I have and just filled me with His peace? So, Lord, we thank you for your truth.